Four Trojan Horses of Humanism by Harry Kahn Chapter 4 Sociology Trojan Horse The most common philosophical mistake of our day is to confuse secular humanism, or any other kind of humanism, be it scientific, ethical, democratic, or religious, with the type of humanism once propounded by Erasmus. Humanism should never be equated in our day with humaneness. Humanism is the most inhumane philosophy ever concocted on our Lord's green earth. It is now the religion of sociology. Humanism is man, autonomous man, starting with man to build himself a worldview and a philosophy of life that eliminates God and any divine dimension. Carl E. Kiefer in his book, Facing Today's Problems, defines humanism in this manner. Quote, Humanism is the belief that man has within himself sufficient resources to solve his problems without help from a supernatural power or person. Secularism is the outgrowth of this belief and regards religion as outmoded superstition or incorporates it into the rest of life. The sacred and the secular become indistinguishable, not because all things are sanctified by the will of God, but because all things, even the most sacred, are secularized by the will of man. End quote. Secular humanism is the summation of all that is anti-God. Communism is humanism with a political disguise. The nature of humanism is that the ultimate end of all human striving is the happiness of man. Sociology never seems to have learned that man never finds happiness by seeking it. It is only achieved by serving one's fellow man and by voluntarily losing one's life for Christ's sake in service to him. We have turned our country over to the white coats the psychologist, psychiatrist, and bureaucrat in Washington to make decisions and policies that govern the country in which we live and raise our children. The humanistic white coats do not often believe in the concept of biblical morality and therefore have no sound theoretical foundation, such as the Ten Commandments, upon which to base their theories. If one has no sound moral basis on which to order life, there will be no intellectual perplexities, let alone pangs of guilty conscience, over the following humanistic innovations. 1. Legalized abortions. 2. Euthanasia, mercy killing. 3. Genetic engineering. 4. Birth control, the state will decide who procreates. 5. Housing, take our children on Monday morning and get them back Friday night. 6. Acceptance of homosexuality. 7. Acceptance of suicide. The Humanist Manifestos 1 and 2 were drafted in 1933 and 1973, respectively, and signed by leading humanists such as John Dewey, B.F. Skinner, and Sir Julian Huxley. These two documents define the philosophy that has been reshaping our society and is now the foundation of public education in the United States. Following are some excerpts from these documents. Quote, We find insufficient evidence for belief in the existence of a supernatural. It is either meaningless or irrelevant to the question of the survival and fulfillment of the human race. As non-theists, we begin with humans, not God, nature, not deity. We affirm that moral values derive their source from human experience. Ethics is autonomous and situational, needing no theological or ideological sanction. We deplore the division of humankind on nationalistic grounds. We have reached the turning point in human history where the best option is to transcend the limits of national sovereignty and to move toward the building of a world community in which all sections of the human family can participate. Thus, we look to the development of a system of world law and world order based upon transnational government. End quote. I would like to quote extensively from the paper Religion of Humanism in Public Schools to offer some background on how our schools are propagating this false religion. Quote, I often think about the religion of humanism being promoted in public schools and without fail, I find myself asking, where, oh where, are the Christians? Why do those who claim to be true followers of Christ permit this hoax to go unchallenged? Every Christian and every Christian church should be actively exposing and working to remove this godless religion from our public schools. One woman's efforts resulted in a ban on prayer and Bible reading. How is it that the people of a nation that claims to be predominantly Christian cannot rout the religion of humanism from their schools? The reasons are many, but I think the main reason that Christians are not working harder to rid public schools, and often their own church schools, of the menace of humanism is that they simply don't know what is meant by the word humanism, or 
they are not sure just how the religion of humanism manifests itself in the schools. So today, I'm going to try to achieve an understanding of humanism as it exists in the schools so that you will know what to look for when you are examining your child's books and materials. Before we do anything else, let's clear up what we mean by humanism or humanistic education. These days we hear the word human and other human-sounding words used to describe what's going on in the educational process. We hear of the need to teach children to be humane, and we think it means children are taught to be kind and compassionate with each other. We hear that schools are promoting human understanding and improved human relations. To the average person, unskilled in the deceitful semantics of educationese, such human-sounding words convey the idea that education is a civilizing process, and this is where we lose many parents. Unless specifically defined otherwise, the terms humanistic education or humanism in the schools or educating for humaneness or educating for human understanding or whatever all mean the same thing the promotion of the principles of the religion of humanism. Quite often some know-it-all would-be intellectual will approach me, and looking disdainfully down his nose with overbearing patience will inform me that I'm woefully confused, that humanistic education means teaching what is known as the humanities, the great classics. But that's not the case. And I have proof, straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak, from none other than the program officer for the National Endowment for the Humanities, William Russell. Writing in the August 1975 issue of the Journal of Education of Boston University School of Education, he offered his description of humanistic education, which included the following. He said, An initial clarification to make is that the term humanistic is not the adjectival form of the noun humanities. Humanistic education does not mean education in the humanities disciplines. So let us never more be confused about the definition of humanistic education. It means promotion of the principles of humanism. The next thing that must be done is to obtain a copy of the Humanist Manifesto 1 and 2. I used the second manifesto because that's what the humanists are currently working from most diligently. I can't stress too strongly that it is absolutely vital that you recognize and understand the major articles of faith expressed in the manifesto, for it is these principles or articles of faith that are being inculcated in your children. Remember, humanism as promoted in the schools is not some nebulous, intangible thing that we know is there but cannot touch. It is very real and can be identified very easily once you know what you're looking for. Specifically, what are some of the principles or articles of faith of humanist belief that find their way into public and even private education? Above all, humanists do not believe in God, and of course, they do not believe in salvation or damnation. They believe in the theory of evolution, a theory that is often presented as fact in many schools and textbooks. Humanists believe that everyone has a right to full sexual freedom, the right to express their individual sexual preferences as they desire. They believe that everyone, regardless of age or condition, has a right to determine the values and goals that affect their lives. They believe in the right to suicide, abortion, and euthanasia. They adhere to situation ethics morality, meaning they do not live by or believe in absolute standards of morality. They recognize no immutable rights or wrongs, as revealed in the Ten Commandments. They believe everyone has a right to maximum individual autonomy, meaning the right of each to do his own thing, whatever it may be. Humanists do not believe in national sovereignty, but in a world government. These are the major articles of faith or principles of humanism as outlined in the Second Humanist Manifesto. How are they applied in public education? Very simply, every course in the curriculum can serve as a vehicle to promote humanist beliefs. History, math, literature, languages, social studies, sex education, environmental education, home economics, everything. Over the years, during the steady influx of humanist influence in the schools via the use of humanist-oriented textbooks and teachers unknowingly trained to become missionaries of humanist beliefs, over many years, Humanist influence has been steady and subtle. However, we have reached a point where apparently it has been determined our society and schools are ready for intensive indoctrination into humanism because we now openly have the ultimate apparatus for promoting humanism in the schools, and it's called values education. When you bring up the subject of values education, someone will always insist that teachers have always been involved in value information, and indeed this is so. 
It is impossible for a teacher to avoid conveying values to students. Her voice, her dress, her general demeanor all convey values of some sort. However, in years past, the values conveyed by teachers in the main reflected parental values, or at least reflected those values that were considered in accord with prevailing Judeo-Christian morality. In years past, there usually wasn't a value conflict between schools and parents. However, today we have a whole new ballgame. Young teachers coming out of teachers' colleges have had thoroughly humanistic education. Many of them, in the process, have lost the religious faith of their youth, or they hang on to some religious orientation, in name only, or adopt some ersatz Christianity. They are quite ready to promote a system of values that is at odds with the traditional Judeo-Christian ethic. They are quite ready to facilitate a value system that will promote humanist beliefs, and in fact, that will create practicing humanists. Many young teachers thoroughly indoctrinated into humanism have a missionary zeal that would put so-called Christians to shame. Now, about values education, let's look at the rationale for having values education in the schools at all. What is the justification offered by promoters of values education? The best answer can be found in a book titled Values Education, A Handbook of Practical Strategies for Teachers and Students, written by the three most prominent leaders in the values education movement. Sidney B. Simon, Leland W. Howe, and Howard Kirchenbaum. The authors explain that young people brought up by moralizing adults are not prepared to make their own choices about what they want to believe. They ask, and I quote, How does the young person choose his own course of action from among the many models and many moralizing lectures with which he has been bombarded? Where does he learn whether or not he wants to stick to the old moral and ethical standards or try new ones? Well, where he learns whether or not he wants to stick to the old morals, or try new ones, is in humanistic values education. And this book gives the teacher 79 different ways to help the student discard the values he has come to school with and find new ones. And lest you still doubt the intent of values education, you should read a book titled New Principles in the Curriculum by Louise M. Burnham. She states very clearly that it is a proper role for the schools to change, create, and clarify students' values. Now let's see how values education is used to promote those humanist beliefs. A series of papers published by the Adirondack Mount Humanistic Education Center, Upper J, New York, explains most compellingly how values education promotes humanist beliefs. Let's start with sex education. In one of those papers titled Sexuality and the School by Marianne and Sidney Simon, the authors tell us that too many teachers are not merely asexual, they are downright antisexual, to the degree that they cause sexual destruction in the schools by causing children, as they put it, to wrinkle up like raisins in the sun. The Simons boldly declare, some changes are desperately needed. Schools can no longer be permitted to carry out such a horrendously effective program for drying up students' sense of their sexual identity. The schools must not be allowed to continue fostering the immorality of morality an entirely different set of values must be nourished. And this is precisely what is happening in sex education. If you still naively think sex education deals only with the facts, be aware that sex education goes beyond the mere teaching of physiology and biology. Sex education openly and frankly deals with the development of attitudes and values. The fact that sex education often extends from kindergarten through grade 12 should tell you that more than teaching the facts of sex is going on. Anything a child needs to know about sex at any given age of his development can be explained to him in a very brief period of time by you, a clergyman, or a physician. It doesn't take 12 continuous years, unless, of course, you're trying to establish or alter values, attitudes, and behaviors along with the facts. The presumption of sex education is that children come to school without values or with values that cause them to wrinkle up like raisins in the sun, values that must be changed. A goal of sex education is to eliminate harmful myths and hang-ups that are, according to humanist belief, and here I quote from the manifesto, fostered by intolerant attitudes often cultivated by orthodox religions and puritanical cultures. Such repressive attitudes about sex prevent children from attaining their full potential as sexual beings and prevent them from expressing, according to humanist terminology, their sexual proclivities and to pursue their lifestyle as they desire. And you've seen the product of this permissive humanistic philosophy. Young people with a scorn for Christian standards of morality, open homosexuality, rampant VD, and untold numbers of abortions. 
For children from a home where strong traditional moral values and standards of behavior are stressed, conflict and guilt are likely to ensue if they choose to depart from their moral upbringing. They have been taught about salvation and damnation, which they can't easily dismiss. So what is the solution? One way to get rid of the Christian myth of salvation and damnation is to teach death education. Interestingly, many death education courses are taught by sex educators, which is quite logical. Sex education tells students sex is for fun, and this is followed by death education, which in accord with humanist beliefs teaches that this life is all there is. There is nothing after death. So if humanistic sex and death education are effective, young people can pursue their sexual proclivities as they desire in keeping with humanist teaching because they have been taught in death education that heaven is here and now, and they will not have to worry about salvation or damnation because this life is all there is. Another humanist principle, the belief in situational ethics morality, finds its way into just about everything. But let's take drug education, for example. Information is presented to students from the position that we are giving you all the facts. You make up your own mind as to how you will use the information. Children without wisdom or maturity are given loaded information and told to make up their own minds about how they will use the information. Then we wonder when under peer pressure or under the influence of drug-oriented rock music and entertainers, whom they idolize, that they decide to use drugs? Christians believe that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and is not to be abused. Humanist philosophy says, make up your own mind. What's important is having fun, here and now, for this life is all there is. Lives shattered by disease and addiction are monuments to humanistic situation ethics behavior, fostered by humanistic situation ethics values education. Another humanist principle is the belief in the right of maximum individual autonomy, the right to do one's own thing, whatever it may be. A dictionary defines autonomous as meaning without outside control. Some time ago in the country in which I live, there was an uproar over a questionnaire administered in the schools by John Hopkins University. Parents were outraged by the many questions that invaded student and family privacy. Parents were justified in their outrage, but they completely overlooked the purpose behind the questionnaire, which was to determine how autonomous the students were becoming. A report issued by John Hopkins explained that one of the goals of open education, which is a euphemism for humanistic education, was to develop self-reliance and autonomous behavior. The report stated, A major part of the growing up process is developing a willingness to act autonomously, to no longer have to depend on one's family or others for excessive guidance and decision-making help. Common sense tells us that we cannot take immature children, lacking wisdom, and turn them loose to act autonomously with any degree of responsibility. This was recognized by educator Thomas B. Gregory in an article in the November 1971 issue of Educational Leadership. He warned that in becoming autonomous, internal controls may not develop, and seeking autonomy may become the immature action of simply resisting further external control. As a result, seeking autonomy may include experimenting with asocial actions, delinquency. End quote. There were 646 church-related colleges in the United States in 1846, and not 10 non-church-related colleges of importance. The Land-Grant Act, signed by President Lincoln in 1862, gave us the state-supported colleges and universities, and is very evident where they obtained their teachers. Needless to say, it was the church's influence in education that produced the following kind of thinking. Quote, People need a way of acting justly, both as individuals and as groups. A person, to maintain his integrity and probably his sanity, needs some consistent idea that his acts will produce certain results, including rewards or punishments. A society, to survive intact, must have some system to decide between right and wrong and balance out its rewards and punishments. End quote. It was taught that a man's heredity, environment, and training will determine his destiny, and that man doesn't have any choice in this destiny. Dr. Viktor Frankl disputes this set of factors and says the main factor has been left out, that of choices. One of the most thrilling truths of Christianity is this. Whatever deficiencies we may have had in our heredity, environment, and training, if we will choose to turn from our selfish ways, seek and find the Lord in true conversion, 
we will get a new Father who will help and love us. The Spirit of God will dwell in us, which is a welcome change in our inner environment, and teach us His ways. We then have the power to change our environment for good and become a part of the solution to the world's problems. Secular Humanism Amendment The Amendment to the Higher Education Act Amendments of 1946, H.R. 12851, called the Conlin Amendment after the Honorable John B. Conlin, was passed by the House but defeated and eliminated in the Senate. The bill stated, quote, No grant, contract, or support is authorized under the Foreign Studies and Language Development portions of Title II of the bill for any educational program, curriculum research and development, administrator-teacher orientation, or any project involving one or more students or teacher administrators involving any aspect of the religion of secular humanism. End quote. Many bills have been before Congress which I personally think are intended to bring about the systematic destruction of Christian influence and its institutions. One example is the Youth Camp Safety Act, H.R. 6761. This would impose health and safety standards on all youth camps, over and above those already imposed on camps by some six federal agencies and up to 12 state agencies. Government standards would also be set for camp directors. In North Carolina alone, it is estimated that 75% of the youth camps, many of them Christian camps, would have inadequate funds to meet these new additional federal standards. Another example is the Charity Disclosure Bill, H.R. 41, which would have the effect of repressing charitable giving. Another example was the proposed Genocide Treaty, which the Carter administration urged the Senate to ratify. This treaty would have subjected American citizens to the jurisdiction of an international court for the alleged crime of causing physical or mental harm to a single member of any specified ethnic, racial, or religious group. Americans would have no constitutional protection of their rights, as treaties become the supreme law of the land, and can override present constitutional guarantees. The treaty excluded political genocide as it would allow governments to liquidate any particular group by classifying them as enemies of the state. However, the crime of causing mental harm is covered by the treaty, and this can mean any attempt to change the cultural, religious, or social mores of any group. On this basis, Protestant and Catholic missionaries could be charged with genocide. This treaty could have possibly caused the return home of every foreign missionary and be the lawful end of obedience to the Great Commission. When I think of sociology and its God, secular humanism, I am reminded of this axiom. It has been observed by sages throughout the ages that man's calloused heartlessness towards his fellow man increases in proportion to his unconcern about God. What good is it to have the assurance of material and physical welfare without love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, or self-control. The euphemism humanism is clever. The word itself is a Trojan horse, beguiling people ignorant of its true definition. It is unwise and confusing to interchangeably use the words cause, a physical term, with influence and reason for behavior, and expect any accountability and responsibility for conduct. Slums may be an occasion of crime, but never a cause. Influence is only a moral antecedent, and cause is that which inevitably brings an effect and is always an amoral event.